We know a fair amount about the contention between the United States and China over trade and in the South China Sea over those islands or whatever we're going to call them. Are we also competing with China in space? Uh, yes, David, that's absolutely true. You know, a lot of this uh, increased concern over sp space has really uh, been sparked by years ago when the Chinese, you know, blew up an old weather satellite of theirs to demonstrate that they, you know, could target assets in space. So, if, so what does that really mean, Rob? Like, where, where's the vulnerability? Is it, is it satellites? What does that wind up doing then on the ground? Where is that conflict going to erupt the most? Well, the, the, the satellites, uh, yeah, are the key vulnerability. You know, they're very, uh, they're, they're very expensive to put up there, and they're actually pretty hard to defend. And so much of our military communications, the GPS signals, which are, are used to position our military forces and even to target our weapon systems, our intelligence systems are highly dependent on space-based assets. So in a conflict, if somebody takes those out, it's a real problem. Uh, Brian Whedon, uh, is this inevitable, or, or is it possible that this is a first step in what could be called an arms race in space? Well, I, I think it's probably better to characterize it as a return to the way things sort of used to be during the Cold War. People sort of forget, they, they tend to focus on sort of the, the NASA human space flight uh, race to the moon with the Soviet Union, but at the same time, we had an active military competition with them in space, and both sides developed and deployed NSA satellite weapons during the Cold War to potentially target and take out each other's satellites in the case of conflict. Now, that never happened, and then after the fall of the Soviet Union, we sort of enjoyed this brief period of time where the U.S. really didn't see any other uh, peer competitors that could really challenge us in space. So, so That's Brian, sort of what's changing. Sorry, Brian, going back to the, to the Cold War, as you say, uh, is there a way to protect our satellites, actually to defend them, or is this more what we used to call mutual assured destruction? Just they won't come after our satellites if we can blow up theirs. Well, that used to be the case during the Cold War, in particular because the U.S. and Soviet satellites were intricately tied to nuclear warning and command and control. But that's no longer the case. We have a situation today where the U.S. is highly vulnerable and dependent uh, with its satellites, and no one else really relies on that much. So there really isn't that sort of mutual assured destruction. So we have this uh, military phenomenon that the president moved forward with yesterday. We also have a big commercial initiative. Uh, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, whenever we talk to him, talks about the commercial possibilities. This is part of what he had to say recently. Space is right now a $400 billion industry. We believe that within a number of years, it will get to be a trillion-dollar industry. Now, 80 percent of the 400 billion of revenues are commercial revenues. And so that's already a radical change. So, Rob, you're a defense analyst, but can you really separate out the defense aspects of this from the commercial? Because, as we just heard from Heather Wilson, the Secretary of Air Force, she said, look, at our, our, our cell phones, our GPS systems, things like that, are heavily dependent upon what's going on in space. Is, are these two really married up, that is to say, the military application with the civilian? Uh, yes, David, that, that is absolutely true, and Secretary Wilson was 100 percent correct. You know, so much of, you know, when you go to your ATM machine or, yeah, use uh, ways in your, in your car or whatever it is, you're dependent on military satellites that are often uh, operated by uh, U.S. Air Force and soon to be, I guess, U.S. Space Force personnel. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, these two things are quite intertwined. And, you know, while they're doing commercial launch, people like Elon Musk and stuff, they're doing a lot of military launches as well. So, Brian, who's winning? What country's winning? They are, because it really depends what you're talking about, how you define the race. Uh, you know, as, as Secretary Wilson sort of hinted at, the U.S. is still pretty far ahead of everyone. We have, particularly in the military case, uh, we have all these capabilities, GPS was mentioned, uh, intelligence, reconnaissance satellites, communication satellites that are pretty far ahead of whatever else anyone else has. What is changing is the relative advantage the U.S. enjoys mm -hmm. over everyone else. Uh, over the last decade or so, uh, Russia and China primarily, but also several other countries have been developing their own military space capabilities, both to be able to enhance their militaries, but also to target the capabilities of other countries to try and lessen that advantage. And Brian, do we have a sense of the relative investment being made by China and perhaps by Russia versus the United States? 
Uh, the U.S. investment is, is still probably the biggest. Uh, the uh, national security space budget, uh, parts of it are classified, but the overall budget is roughly about $25 billion a year. Okay. Uh, my sense is that is at least twice, if not more, what the other two countries provide okay. uh, or, or are spending on theirs. But what they are focusing a lot of their investment on is the counter space or anti-satellite capabilities. That, that's where they're putting a lot of the money because they know if there is a future conflict between the U.S. and Russia or the U.S. and China, it's going to be the U.S. trying to play, let's say, an away game in their neighborhood. And if they can disrupt the U.S. space capabilities, that makes it really difficult for the United States to do that. Hmm, interesting through line. If we follow the money even more than to the company level, Rob, um, how much of say walk us out the next 10 to 20 years how much of an incremental earnings driver can this be for some of the defense companies well of course you know the the big players right now are of course uh, united launch alliance which is really lockheed and boeing and spacex you know those are the ways but uh, uh blue origin is is also uh getting into the space and then there's sort of another sub market we're seeing of smaller rockets uh, you know darpa the defense advanced research project agency is holding competitions for smaller rockets to get smaller satellites up that's a way of of you know you can't really defend your satellites very well but you could, if you can replace them quickly you sort of serve the same purpose so there's a whole smaller rocket smaller satellite market that's always uh, that that's also growing here and dod is also trying to encourage that market so yeah there's a lot going on and, and i think the trajectories are only upward Brian, we started this by saying that President Trump had signed an order that started a process. As I understand it, actually, we need congressional action to really have another branch of the military. Is this a done deal, or could this get held up? Oh, it is certainly not a done deal. Uh, this is a debate that's been going on for at least 20 years, back to 2001, uh, when Don Rumsfeld chaired a report talking about how to reorganize national security space. And Congress actually re-upped this issue with efforts uh, about two years ago that got stalled out. Uh, so it, it's certainly not a done deal, but I will say that what was in the proposal yesterday was the creation of a, a new Space Force division within the Department of the Air Force. And that does have more support within Congress than President Trump's original demand, which was for a completely separate department of the Space Force mm -hmm. that would be on par with the Army, the Navy, and, and, and the uh, the Air Force.